Welcome back to the quarantined edition of Soul Back. This is Kyle <laughs> with Tom and Ed. Guys, how bored are you right now? Well, uh, let me tell you about boredom. I'm seeing all these Facebook statuses about how people are so bored and they've run through their Netflix queue and they've played all their video games. I wish you could just come sit in my office chair for five seconds because this brother is anything but bored. I am hustling. I actually like it. It's kind of fun because... We could run the site, you know, while we're locked up in here, and we have more time to spend on, on supporting R&B now, right, Kyle? Yeah. I mean, I've spent a lot of time over the past week listening to music. Uh, I think go. Jermaine Dupri posted that, right? We can be shut down from everything, but we'll still have our music. So I've gone ahead, and, I, and Tom, I know you have as well. You've gone back into the vault. You started digging up some albums that maybe you forgot about or you never actually checked yep. out. So it's not the end of the world, but... Ed, apparently uh, you've become vegan. Vegan? How has this happened? <laughs> well, didn't you go to like the store and they ran out of meat like 20 times? Uh, yes, and again, I am annoyed by this. Look, I'm going to go on my one-time pandemic rant and then we can get into some R&B. Look, players, take it from somebody. This isn't one of these Facebook random posts from weirdo.com or whatever. This is somebody who was literally sitting in the meetings with the health officials. Literally. We talking to them. Stop hoarding up everything. There's plenty of food to go around. People are hoarding up stuff. And it's ridiculous because all the older people who could benefit from having, you know, food and sustenance, they're the ones sitting around eating Lunchables. Grandma over here eating crackers. <laughs> while the people who don't even know how to cook got a freezer full of steaks. Come on now, let the uh, people eat. My wife went to get groceries about a, um, I guess about a week ago. It was last Sunday, her normal grocery day. She couldn't find anything. We got a bunch of pizzas in the freezer. So she went oh, yesterday oh, and actually what? found some actual meat. <laughs> so it is insane. Y'all, everybody calm down. All you have to do is wash your hands. Stop licking guardrails. You don't have to do that. Just wash your hands. <laughs> keep your hands to yourself. Sanitize. And go sit down, and everything will be fine. That's all you have to do. Those three things will keep you safe. <laughs> wow. Tom, uh, Greek yogurt is still in stock, I hope? Well, I, I'm glad you asked, Kyle, because there's plenty. We just bought four cartons of it, actually. I'm here in New York City, and the funny part is, everyone, you know, be safe wherever you're at listening. But in here in New York, we got supermarkets stocked up. It's funny when I see, and we, we have the most cases here. But around the world where people are posting pictures from their supermarkets in, like, North Dakota who have nothing left and no toilet paper is just wild to me. So everyone just calm down. It's going to be all right. We'll get through it. Just relax. You don't need that much toilet paper. Leave some for yes, Grandma. You, yes, Grandma needs the toilet paper more than you. Why do you have <laughs> toilet paper like that? I'm wilding out. I'm so annoyed. <laughs> Man. <laughs> but, Tom, let's, uh, let's put some positivity in the air. Can you give some shout-outs here? Because we had a lot of loyal fans over the years but this past week a lot of people maybe because they aren't actually doing anything right now they've been giving us a lot of love so we got to show love back man we we have some loyal listeners and ed i know you have a list of your own as well i'm, I'm probably going to overlap some of these but we just want to give some quick shout outs to some some of our bigger supporters over the years and who tune into the show every week if i if i left you out don't worry about it we'll get to you next week or in the coming weeks but we really appreciate you too but just quick shout out to DJ Soulchild, Daniel Vuong, David Dwayne, Del Williams, Mrs. Superwife, GD Holland, Ben Cromwell, Slick Partner, Montrez Jones, Todd Davis, Dahl Dyson, Lady T, Derek Dunn, Nick Eden, John Betts, Amber Meyer Ricks, Dan Bamber, Wesley Barrett, Jamarcus Andre Mims, Erica Batts, Moselle Underwood, and Mary Jo. I appreciate your support. And, Ed, we can't forget about our new friend. This guy was actually streaming our podcast on the beach in Dubai, I think. Oh, yeah. That was what's up. That was <laughs> that was quite wild when I saw my mentions that my boy was playing the freaking podcast in Dubai. Shout out my... It's funny that it, I saw Dubai because one of my wife's best friends is currently out there. So, look at Soulback getting love all the way across seas. I love it. Not only was he in Dubai, Kyle, that it was a French, a guy from France, I believe. Yep. I mean, that's pretty. Yep. That's pretty cool. 
Yeah, we're out here spreading that R&B, but uh, we have a couple of things up our sleeves today. Uh, you guys may have seen, we tweeted out, this is sort of our Ask Us Anything edition of the podcast. We didn't anticipate there'd be like 30 submissions, so we'll try to get <laughs> to as many as we can. If not, we'll try again next week. I mean, we have lots of time, maybe except Ed, apparently he's been up since 3 a.m., but me and Tom, <laughs> we have a Don't lot of time. Me. But before we get into all of that fun stuff, let's quickly go through some new music here. And this is quite interesting because all three of these songs that I want to talk about sample a song that we're all familiar with. John Legend sampled Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg on Actions. Um, Division oh, with Snow Davison. Allegra. Davison. Oh, right. <laughs> Davison. Davison. Yes. Uh, them Good and Lord. Snow Allegra sampled Nice and Slow by Usher. And then Tamar. Crazy Kind of Love sampled Whitney Houston, Saving All My Love for You. Um, which one did? Which one stood out most to you guys? Well, before, let me talk a little bit about the art of sampling, because these samples have come up, and at least over on the Soul and Stereo Cypher, over on Facebook, go check us out. You ain't doing nothing, you ain't at work, so go to check out on Facebook. Anyway, so, yeah, we it's kind of been a kind of a recurring conversation about samples. Now, I think that as a child of the 90s and a fan of 90s music, anybody that complains about samples is kind of ridiculous because most of the biggest hits were samples of the 70s, which is true. However, I do get the argument for samples because, against samples because I like my samples to be subtle and not so on the nose. And when we talk about these three songs, one of them is not like the other because first you got John Legend riding Dr. Dre's beat. Kind of reminds me of classic John Legend, the um, the original Get Lifted era John Legend. I really like it. Really fits him, and we've been missing that sound from him. That was pretty good. We got Davison or Dandruff or whatever Tom calls him. Dandruff? <laughs> Division player. Yeah. They, again, in Snow Allegra, did a nice flip of Nice and Slow. But the issue I had was with Tamar's, because Tamar's kind of her rendition was a little too on the nose on the sample. I don't like when you just ride it so much that you're just kind of switching the beat up. Sound like something we would do in French class when we were bored and we just start singing songs and making our own songs up. I thought that she was a little too on the nose with that sample. Okay song, but when you sound so close to the Whitney rendition, kind of takes away from what you're trying to do. So of the three, I would definitely say that Tamar missed the mark for me, but the other two were pretty solid. Well, I didn't give him Tom, a, a good enough you. listen, Kyle. I'll let you chime in if you want to share your favorite of the three. No, well, what I was going to say, because you and I had this conversation about the John Legend record, that's the one you did lis- listen to, and that yeah. one sample is Dr. Dre. Don't you feel like there's some records that we shouldn't touch at all? Because, like, that song, I don't care how amazing of a job you do on it, we're going to listen to it and think immediately to Dr. Dre. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, and it, it just overpowers the song, in my opinion. I did get what Ed was saying, though, about it reminds you of a throwback to John Legend's earlier work. Ed, I don't know if you felt this, but it kind of reminded me of his his vocal tone from when he did the album with The Roots, like a decade ago. Yes. Which, which is an overlooked yes. project and really was pretty good, actually. It was called Wake Up. I mean, it we want to hear Wake that from Up. John Legend. Yeah. But, like, I just couldn't I, uh, get past the sample. It was just overpowering. I get what you're saying, though. The sample, I thought, again, worked a lot better than Tamar's. I thought hers was way too overpowering. If I'm listening to a song and I'm, like, humming the original version in my head, then that's a misfire because I'm, I'm thinking about the old person. I'm not thinking about the new person. But I get your point mm-hmm. about John Legend. I actually kind of shouted his album out recently, last month, when I was shouting out those projects for um, Black History Month, and I thought that was... A very underlooked and over underrated project. So, you're right. That was the John Legend that I want to hear. We haven't heard in a minute. So it's kind of cool to hear that again. And it's good he still got a little gas in his tank when it comes to soul. Mm-hmm. I was waiting for someone to yell out "Smoke weed every day." Nate Dogg style on that song, but it never happened. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> that's not gonna happen on that record. Not on a John Legend record. Um, I just want to quickly follow up on some topics that we discussed last week and i think we have some answers on now 
last week, you guys were mad about Alicia Keys not announcing her pushback of her upcoming album, Alicia. Well, she's finally done it. She went on Facebook and posted that the album is pushed back due to the pandemic that's going on. Um, although it seems like everything was already pushed back before the lockdown <laughs> happened, so I'm not sure if I buy it. Oh. Play, play. We know how time works. Like that was pushed yeah. back last week before the pandemic. Chill out. Oh, just be honest, please. I know. <laughs> and then the other thing that was quite interesting, Drew Hill, the new version of Drew Hill, was on uh, the Breakfast Club last week as well. This was Cisco Black and Smoke, and you know a lot of people have commented on it. And again, I personally like the pairing or the trio because they all sound great, but. One of the interesting things that I took away from that um, interview, Cisco said that Def Jam in 99 didn't believe in Cisco's solo project. They wanted another Drew Hill album. It's kind, of, it's kind mm. of crazy to look back at now because we all looked at Cisco even in 98 as the superstar. We knew this guy had the potentials to be a great solo artist. So to hear that Def Jam didn't want it, didn't believe in it, and Cisco had to use his own money to put the project together and sell it back to Def Jam. That's kind of interesting to look back at. Yeah, I wish I had a chance to listen to that interview, but um, as as Kyle said, I've been up since three. Give me a break. So I haven't (laughs) had a chance to listen to it, but that's interesting because when you look back at that era, he was just the next R&B star destined to blow. If you had to make a list of the top three or four guys or women that would be taking us into the next decade, he would definitely be number one or two on the list, no question. So it is odd that Def Jam was kind of like, uh, maybe it's just because Drew Hill at that point was a more proven commodity than Cisco was a solo act. Of course, looking back in hindsight, you're like, of course he could do it. But we didn't know in 98, 99 how far he could take it. So maybe that was the hesitation. We know these labels like to play it safe. I will chime in on two two points real quick. First off, I don't think anyone really ever gives Cisco credit for this. He's always been loyal to the group. I mean, quite honestly, yes. he could have went off and become a solo star on his own and never looked back. He didn't do that. He always came back to Drew Hill, and I got to respect him for that. Now, he's done some solo you know, gigs and stuff over the years and projects, but it, I appreciate the fact that he's always come back to the group. The number two thing, I'm on Wikipedia, Kyle, right? And it's stating that Unleash the Dragon sold moderately at first until the novelty hit Thong Song turned into a runaway hit. Now, I don't know if you guys remember that, but really would it have been a a lot different if Thong Song, which I don't think anyone really considers an R&B classic, more of just like it says a novelty hit, would have been Mm -hmm. in the bag. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to look back. It might have even flopped if not for that song. Very much so. I mean, I think, what was the first video with... Because he filmed a video, and it was like he was fighting Godzilla in it. I guess Unleash the Dragon had to be it. Yes. And that yes. didn't do anything. So I get the kind of hesitation. It's like, oh, uh, this ain't working. And then all of a sudden, he's dancing on around on the beach talking about thongs, and <laughs> a mega star is made. Again, hindsight, yeah. this seems crazy, but at the time, not as crazy as it seems. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but Got to Get It was the first single. Mm. Yes, I That's remember that. Yeah. So, oh, and that didn't. No, I know there was. Yeah. Hmm. But that's interesting. And it did to look okay. Yeah, I mean, because he was really pushing against even having incomplete on the album, and that ended up being a number one song. He just yeah wanted to kind of separate from the Drew Hill sound. But I've I've heard people say, and this is something that a lot of R and B fans say that that. Cisco debut album that kind of changed R&B because if you listen to it even the record with Beanie right it was more hip hop influenced than mm. R&B R&B mm. yeah I think I, I think that might be kind of a stretch though Ed to say that I don't, I don't know are you trying to say it kind of took R&B into the hip hop realm like what's the how did it change R&B well even on some of the later, or not later, but the Drew Hill songs, where Cisco's like pretty much rapping on those songs, I think that kind of transitioned R and B R and B into a different place. Yeah, I, I guess I can see that. 
A little bit, not to the levels that it would later become. I, I, I hear what you're saying there. To me, I think that was just kind of like a Cisco style thing. I don't know if it would be the one that would kind of put us over the top to get us where we were are now. That was still a few years down the road. But as far as the transitioning of the sound, I'll give you that. That was a part of that. Yep. Yep. And Tom, you're right. Cisco actually had a Drew Hill record on both his uh, her, his first two solo albums. So we got to give yep. uh, Cisco some credit for this. 100%. Yeah, he always did. He always showed love. Yep. So can I just ch- Tom, say one thing about? I mean, speaking about the interview you mentioned on the Breakfast okay. Club, I had showed you another interview I saw with Drew Hill. It was another major major media outlet. I'm not going to say which outlet, but they they asked the three members, you know, Drew Hill, and we love we we love um, Cisco, Smokey, and Black. But they asked them, you know, what is your opinion on how Drew Hill helped, you know, shape the way hip hop was brought into R and B or something like that? Like they were literally asking um, Smokey and Black, like they were there with Drew Hill. In the beginning, like it was, it's just embarrassing to see journalists carry themselves like that. First and, of all, player, don't don't <laughs> don't give them that J word because they, I went to school for it. They didn't. Don't give them the J word. They don't get to be journalists. All you have to do, y'all, for you mm-hmm. inspire. And I'm not trying to be the guy that's like, oh, he thinks he's better than us. But I'm just saying this: if you know that you are going into an interview with an artist. You have so many tools at your fingertips, literally. Go to Wikipedia. Study up on these. Don't just walk up into the interview and start spitting off stuff at the top of your head. Because anybody who has been paying attention to R&B for two years knows that Player and that Smokey and Black was not with Drew Hill back in the 90s. Come on now. It's just (laughs) you set yourself up for embarrassment. Yep. And not to mention Smokey and Black in their own right changed r&b as well with static so yes. it's a it's it's quite unfortunate i think uh, i was quite disappointed in the breakfast club interview they didn't really dive into players history either so guys if you want to get into that listen to our podcast episode that we did with Smokey and black probably about a year ago now it gives you a lot there yes um and it's probably a little better than the breakfast club interview but shout out to them. it's they one of my job. favorites <laughs> and uh, it shows another- when you got three Three people who know what they're talking about talking to artists that they love and respect other than somebody that wants to get someone on the show just because they were on TV one and looking for some dirt and gossip. Big difference. Kyle, we had another person on that episode, didn't we? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. We had the longtime manager, Kevin Peck. Shout out to Kevin. Spoke to him recently. <laughs> Gave me a lot of inside information about Drew. Uh, we won't get into that today, unfortunately, because gonna, we have other things to do. <laughs> I'm trying to keep trying to keep y'all safe today. I'm trying to be the good one, at least for now. Give me ten minutes, and I might be wild. Uh, yeah, but uh, some more interesting news here, uh, Tom. Before we get into your trivia, because I know people like <sighs> trivia's, but um, uh, JoJo recently released a coronavirus version of her hit single "Leave Get Out." Um, she's been doing these live streams at home, as well as uh, John B., Eric Roberson. I think Keanu Lede is about to do one. Might be ki- missing a couple of names here, but man, people. John Legend, of course, he's uh, he's up doing that as well. But man, people are bored, but we're benefiting from it. <laughs> people are <laughs> bored, yes. Ed, I'm waiting for the moment that someone makes the excuse, oh, the coronavirus got into my computer and I lost my whole album. Like it took out my computer. <laughs> Like someone's gonna, gonna happen as an excuse. I had to push my album back. The vi- the virus got into my computer. Oh, you know it's gonna happen. Oh, I had <laughs> I just had a little I had a touch of the Rona. I just had a little touch of the Rona, so that album got pushed back a little bit. <laughs> I, it's coming. Oh. But Tom, you had a chance to tune into John B's live stream. I really enjoyed watching that because I was expecting him to just do like what he usually does, but from his home, like his normal show. He actually did a lot of um, deep album cuts, like some fan favorites, which I thought was really cool because you never get to see that when he's at his shows. He really just does the singles. He doesn't have enough time. So he was at his home on the piano, just grooving, playing, you know, singing to some of his, you know, non-singles. You know, he did a couple singles, but I thought that was pretty cool. And he's doing it every Thursday it's called the Vibe Select Cafe. I, I wish more artists would follow in the lead and, and do something unique like this. 
But if they don't want to do that, Tom, I think there's something better that they can do. LMA has given out her Nintendo friend code so you can play Mario Kart oh. with her. It, is that Man. exciting? Right after the show is over, Kyle, let's go. <laughs> We're playing against LMA. <laughs> I, mean, I guarantee I like you two will be the first one to want it. <laughs> so, man, it's uh, it's quite interesting. I know last week we were talking about whether this was the right opportunity for artists to put out music. And from what I've seen, a lot of labels and publicists are still going forward with releasing music. I think we can thank streaming for that. Um, I think it may have taken a hit on their marketing strategy a little bit. But as far as I know, Brandy's single is still set to come out next week with Chance. I think the album, co- mm. I mean, the single cover has come out now. So it'll be interesting, Tom, to see if streaming numbers increase due to this or if people have found better things to do at home, like cleaning out their closet or folding clothes. <laughs> well, don't forget, guys. I mean, one really big impact this thing is having is artists are having to cancel their tours. Like JoJo had a tour lined up to, to promote her upcoming album. I believe she had yep. to cancel it. And many other artists... And not only that, like show, like artists who make a living doing this now are losing income. You know, they do shows every weekend, like a John B, for example. You know, he he has shows booked every weekend. He's gonna have to, he had to cancel months worth of shows, so he's losing income. And uh, I mean that that goes the same for so many artists around. You know, sometimes we take for granted, think these artists are just so rich and they don't need the money, but like that's their livelihood. Streaming isn't paying the bills. The shows are what's paying the bills. So. We don't know when we're going to get back to seeing live shows, but it's a really unfortunate thing going on right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty annoyed by it. I was going to see my boys, Drew Hill slash Player, 112, Brian McKnight. I can't remember who else was on the bill. That was all going to be next Sunday. Nope, not going to happen. So a lot of times, to your point, Tom, we do think these artists are just rolling in the dough from that still eating off of those 90s checks and that's not necessarily the case touring keeps the lights on and Mm -hmm. at this point with this pandemic going on everybody's hurting a little bit so if you want to support these artists check them out streaming doesn't do a lot but it's better than nothing so if they're they're out here they're trying to stay connected with these little concerts mini concerts that they're doing from home and trying to drop some new music here and there check them out support them and guys, I do have to give a quick shout out to all the promoters, um, including Live Nation, who immediately canceled a lot of their shows. Um, unfortunately, one of the last shows, which was not put together by Live Nation, but the Millennium Tour that was still happening, um, there, it was reported that one person in the crowd actually had the case of the coronavirus, mm-hmm. and they were at the show. So I don't know what comes of that. Hopefully my girl Ashanti is okay because she was performing <laughs> on that tour. But, Ed, I don't know if I would want to go out. I, I want to make sure I'm safe at home. That's the point. And, again, I've seen a lot of stuff on social media. People, it, it's one thing where it's, you get to stay home. And it's like, oh, I don't have to go to work. But then when they're homebound, it's like, oh, I don't want to miss my concert that I've been looking forward to for two months. And I don't want to do this. And Everybody just needs to take this thing seriously. Stay home. Be good. Let it pass. So it's annoying as crap for both artists and fan. But let's just take a month to chill, play your Nintendo Switch, catch up on your <laughs> DVR, and just let this pass. And then hopefully we'll be back to normal soon. Just stop buying up all the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tom. Is it trivia time? Oh, man. I've been waiting for this all week, guys. Ed, are you ready for this? I don't know, but I'll try to be ready. Let me ask you a question. Do you consider yourself an R&B expert? Um, obviously. Okay, good, because I got six, uh, I guess, a bit challenging questions. I'm going to start out easy and get harder. There's six. I'm going to okay. see if you can answer all of them. If you can't answer them, Kyle's allowed to chime in with some help. The only okay. thing I ask is g- give a few seconds before answering so for anyone out there listening, they could think about it and, and come up with the answer themselves. No, oh, good so idea. So they can play along <laughs> yeah. at home. I'm playing the role of ridiculing Ed. I'm ready. All right, you ready for this? We're going to start out easy. This is an easy one. Ed, ready? Name the members of the Whitehead Brothers. The members of the Whitehead Brothers? Oh, my gosh, player. Your cousins. (laughs) I mean, I... Did you say my cousins? Oh, my God. 
How long are we giving for um our listeners out there? Go ahead. Shout out to my man Kenny. And uh mm-hmm. what's the other dude's name? Oh, um, give me a second. No, no, I know come it. On, I know it. Um, you gotta know the other guy's name. That's it's our Chucky boy. Booker. K- Kenny N- Chucky Booker, calm down. <laughs> no. <laughs> Is it like Johnny? Kenny and Johnny? Yes. Correct. Wow. Yes, you I, got it. Uh, R&B yeah, expert. Kenny's my man. Shout out to Kenny, though. R&B expert. That was a little shaky, but all right. It, it gets better from oh. here. Don't worry. All right. Question number two. Can you name a solo song by this artist? The artist is Nate Dogg. A solo song from Nate Dogg? Yes. I mean... I, uh, what was that song with I got to sing it in my head come on Ed came out in 2003 one of the greatest R&B hook singers of all time Nate Dogg just one solo but song but name, name his own song <laughs> yeah I was like we're talking about solo songs we're not talking about like the other songs he was on because I can name 74 of those oh what was the name of that song that uh 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 uh, uh, I got love. I got love. I had to get to the hook. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I remember that song. Wow. Ed, do you remember the song Never Leave Me Alone? Yeah. With Snoop Dogg? Snoop Dogg that, was on that, yeah. That's the one I remember from him. I, it's hard to name Nate Dogg songs. Can you name any, Kyle? No. Of course not. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, moving on. Can you name this artist who was originally part of Boys to Men, but left the group prior to the group releasing their first album. Easy money. Kyle, you gotta know this one. Oh, of course I know this one. He wrote a joint on Brandy's album. Yes. Go Y'all ahead. ready? The Go wonderful ahead. Mark Nelson. Yes, correct. What was the name of his debut album? Oh, now that I can't remember. Chocolate oh, Mood. What? Chocolate Mood. Is that right? No. No. No? No. Chocolate Mood? Mark Nelson? Yeah. Oh, Chocolate. that was his second what? album. That was his second album, 1999. Hmm. Ch- Chocolate right. Mood. I Mark do not Nelson, I mean of Kyle. course Yeah, we know him, but and I know he had albums Remember out the but the song I couldn't 15 name minutes? Him. All I got is fifteen minutes. Remember the song? Hmm. Yep, I do know that. Actually, song. I, okay, moving, actually, I moving do not along. That song. <laughs> moving along. Question number four out of six. Okay. Name the singer on the hip hop song "Love You Better" by LL Cool J. Oh, see now that is a weird <laughs> one because Man, you got to get Kyle knows this. This no, is this boy. is tricky because in social media, pre-social media era. There were so many rumors about who was on this song. What? Who? Who? Yes, you don't remember this? No, because I, I knew the, the answer excuses, when it came out. The <laughs> excuses are coming already, Kyle. And I am I cannot think of dude's name, dude. Because dude there was, was also, there was a there was a point where people were saying it was Martin Nelson at one point, and I was like, no, it's not him. Close, but no. Close. Dude, dude was also on uh, another is, LL Cool J song. You should. Who else is? Oh, Mark Dorsey. That's, was it him? There you go. That's how you yep. know it from from the other LL Cool J song. No, you said close. Oh. I was like Mark song. Oh, there you. It go. was either him or Mark Morrison. But um. <laughs> but no, you don't remember the rumors. It was like people were saying it was Pharrell singing. People were saying it was Mark Nelson singing. It was all over the place because he Bro, never the internet was, was a... around back then. I was on the Neptune's forums back then, man. They they had all the facts. Hold up, Ed. Well, that you got a question. That was. Go ahead. Did anyone did anyone ever think it was Chad? <laughs> no one ever said Chad was singing a hook of "Love You Better." Uh, no. Damn. Uh, all right, we're moving along. Question number five of yes. six. Okay. Ed, there's no chance you're gonna get this one right. If you do, I'll be highly impressed. And I'll take an episode right. off and let Barry Bars fill in for me one week. Question well, five. you just may have written your own epitaph there. 
Name one member of this female R&B group. The name of the group is ISIS. Ooh. Oh my gosh. What's my girl's name? The main singer. She had an album out. She's the only one I remember. She and I can't think of her name tattoo. right now. She also had a huge tattoo on her chest. Yes. <laughs> Someone on our YouTube comment said it looked like a Christmas tree. Oh my gosh. No, it doesn't. Is it a pineapple? I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I'm guessing. I'm not gonna know. remember her name. It started with an was it was it A? No, no, I can't remember. But no, I I love Kyle? ISIS, but I can't think. Sorry, old girl. Kiara Martin, Kiki Martin, that's my yes. girl. Kiki, yes, Kiki Martin, Kiki, yes. For and anyone else, still... along. Huh? Isn't there? I contend. Lamaya Good. That's like the the, Megan the sister, sister of uh, Megan Good. Yes, correct. And Mary yes, Sue, right. Eric Bellinger. Bet oh you didn't know yes, that one. I did. No, I didn't know that. Yep, correct. The other members are Ardina Clark and Letitia Harrison. Ardina Clark is who I was thinking of. I loved ISIS. I thought that they had something. All right, final question. We're running out of time. Okay. This is your makeup question. To name a member of a group. Name one member oh, of God. the group Coffee Brown. Ooh. The group who? Oh, Coffee Brown? Yeah. I just tweeted I just tweeted it. Of course you would say Coffee Brown. That's your boys. <laughs> um it was like I know the girl was V, but I'm forgetting yes. on my man's name. What was you my get man's credit name? for that? You get credit. She actually goes by V, so you get credit. Falante was but the I'm... guy. Falante. I thought he had like another name though. Fonz. Because I thought it was like V and F. It was like two kind of like initial sounding things. Well, Wikipedia doesn't confirm your theory, but that's it's... pretty good. I, I you give got him a pass you got for credit that. for that one. All right, so well, overall, five out of six. Well five no, out of six get... ain't too bad. Wait, hold on. Didn't you get the Mark Dorsey one wrong? No, I got Mark Dorsey. Mm. No, 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 I didn't. I got. I gave him a hint. <laughs> yeah, I that. Give me that one. That was close enough. All right, all right. That was fun, guys. We'll, maybe we'll bring that back for another episode. Yeah, bring that back. I like stretching the old R and B muscles. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a quick hip hop. Trivia for both of you. Uh -oh. Okay. Is Illmatic one of your favorite hip hop albums of all time? Yes. Yes. It better. Best. Well, I'm kicking off the this best. podcast. All right. So if I were to ask, what is the fifth song on the album? You guys would know it. Yes. Oh my god! Number I probably know not. Half you would know off. it just. And there you go. Is it? Jeez, I am impressed. Yep. <laughs> yep. I knew that. Ed, come I on, it's am only impressed. 10 tracks. It's only 10 tracks. Well, yeah. I know the first you know song what? and the last song, but I couldn't think of the fifth song. You got to keep studying your these classics, Ed. Oh, you're my. Now I'm too, getting that. You're listening to too much Davison, man. That's what it is. Nah, the <laughs> leave Dandruff alone. We're talking about <laughs> hip hop. Legendary albums here. I know the Genesis. I know it ain't hard to tell. Everything else is just kind of in the middle there. So give a brother oh. a break. And there you go. Uh, let me quickly go into the mailbox here to see some of these fan questions that have been submitted. Shout out to all, all of our readers on Twitter. Yeah, Facebook, we got a bunch Instagram. of interest. Got a couple here. I don't want to go through all of them because we'd be here all day, but... I thought this one was rather interesting. I think this will fire all of us up a little bit here. This came from Slick Partner, as well okay. as Jody. Shout outs to both of them. They asked, pretty much. Well, Slick Partner mentioned that some of our most successful acts over the last 30 years haven't necessarily been the greatest vocalists, like a Bobby Brown, like a Chris Brown. They're talented, but I don't think anyone would call them the greatest vocalists of all time. So Jody wanted mm -hmm. to know. How often over the years has the true vocalist, some of the best vocalists, been at the top of the game and had success and actually had a hit? That, 
That is a great question because the way this industry works, especially in 2020, we see it more now than ever. It's not really talent that wins out. It's just positioning. But I do think there were times where if you look in R&B's history that the best vocalist was the best artist. If you look at Usher's run in the early 2000s, he got to be up there. Mariah's run uh, in the early 90s, he got she got to uh, be up there. Wait, hold on, hold on. We're considering Usher one of the best vocalists? For his era, yes. Oh, for his, okay, that's how we're looking at it? Yeah, for I can't say era? all time. <sighs> I'm talking about his, eras. But he's a 90s, I mean, he came through the 90s. So who are we comparing him to, like 90s artists? No, I'm talking well, about for his... Yeah, that's not fair either, because Usher came out when he was, like, 15. So you got to compare him to other 15-year-olds right. at that time. Yeah, we've had this discussion a couple weeks ago. Like, I feel like you have to... Art, when you were t In Usher specifically, we're talking about his peak. So, at the top of his game, at the top of his vocal ability, I think that he was putting out hits and celebrated for that. That ain't always the case, but for him it was. Well... I think for me, it's an easy answer. I mean, things really changed. I think in the 80s, you could probably get away with just being the best vocalist and not being a great entertainer. But like as we went through the 90s, you had to be the best entertainer. You couldn't just be the best vocalist because, I mean, there wasn't really an appetite for that. People bought so much into the image and who you were and all the sex appeal. I mean, really, the best vocalist didn't really matter as much starting in the 90s, in my opinion. And it just yep. got even less and less important as we moved into the later years. So, I mean, if you look at Chris Brown, Bobby Brown, they're great entertainers. So, I mean, listen, I used to book shows here in New York for the Soul Village show. I've seen some amazing vocalists who just stood at the microphone, hugging the microphone like they were nervous. They had no stage presence. They were It wasn't entertaining. It was like, okay, you got a great vocal performance, but it didn't really fully immerse you in the experience. So... I think what you you know what it is is that labels tapped into finding true entertainers, and 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 those are the ones who became the true stars. I mean, correct me guys if I'm wrong. No, I don't think you're wrong at all. But the thing that kind of bothers me when you look at where we are now to where we were is that there were times where even the best entertainers still had some sort of quality that put them up there. So whereas mm. when you put it like that. No, let me finish, because when you put it like a Bobby Brown, Bobby Brown was not the best vocalist of 1991, but arguably he probably had the most stage presence. So therefore, him being at the top of that era, OK, we'll give you that. However, mm. if you look at today, it's more like because the the industry is so totally changed and so manufactured. You can place someone up there with a lot of bells and whistles, whether it's social media hype or stuff that just have no bearing on your actual talent, and you can still be positioned near the top. So that's what kind of bothers me today. You can still be not necessarily the best singer, but you're still a great singer. You're just not the best singer. Today, I don't know if you even have to be the most mediocre. Hmm. Ed, I'm going to throw a name at you here, and... FYI, this is no shot at this artist. I think they're tremendously great, legendary mm -hmm. even, and have put out some classic albums. And that's the thing I'll say about them is they've put out great music over the years. But TLC, they've never been great vocalists. They've been great entertainers, but I don't think any three of them are considered even good vocalists. Nah, Chili was okay. But no, your point is taken. And they were... Again, they were about entertaining because they had great entertaining shows and appeal. So at different points in times, that point is correct. There were times where you were the best for that era, and then there were times where you were the best entertainer. But there was never a time where you weren't the best entertainer or the best singer, and you were still positioned at the top. That's what's weird about today. Hmm. All right. So, here's another question for you. Tom's going to be fired up for this one, I just know. <laughs> this comes from Killa Cam. Uh, no relation to Cameron from Dipset, I hope. But maybe he does tune into the podcast as well. I hope. Do you Shout out to Killa Cam. <laughs> I know him on Instagram. 
Tom, do you think there will be a new R&B star that appeals to both young and old R&B fans? <laughs> I'm, I'm curious why you think that's going to fire me up. I mean, the answer is a resounding no. I can't... <laughs> <sighs> but see, see, it's not it's not a total no because the way they're forcing these artists onto Urban AC, it's like grown folks are getting confused and thinking they should accept these artists. It's like it's such a confusing time. But as far as like, are, are we going to get a new young Stevie Wonder who's going to be like eighteen and and the new Stevie Wonder and grown folks are going to love them and kids are going to love them? There's no way. That's too much of a generational. G- I, I don't see it happening, Ed. I don't see it either, but the thing is that the potential is there, and I'll throw a name out, Lucky Day. That's an artist that I feel like could appeal to older fans because he has those the tradition and the foundation of kind of more traditional R&B, yet he's new enough and oh. young enough, and he's got Kyle. enough kind of the way wait, his Kyle. writing is kind of... Kyle, wait, can you wait, fill what? us in on you Lucky say, Day? Hold up, hold up. Wouldn't you say her as well? If you're gonna say lucky, oh. I think her. I think her has some some. When it comes to like the potential for those those nuggets, those building blocks, sure. But I, the problem is they aren't positioned that way. Unfortunately, hip hop especially, but we're seeing this in R and B too. We are kind of pitting as he who shall not be named was all in this too. We're positioning old against young. It's like this is a new artist. It's a new artist, so therefore, it's not for you. Even if they could have some stuff that would appeal to older audiences, they're positioned to be like, you're not with them. So we're making these weird divides, even though there are a few artists out there that I feel like could. Kevin Ross is another one that I think mm-hmm. that could appeal to both sides, if positioned that way. But I don't think no. they're going to be positioned that way. Can I go again, Kyle? Go ahead. See, I, I think there's such a divide between what the sound that younger kids are listening to and what grown folks, you know, grew up on. I don't see many similarities. So I don't see how. I mean, Ed, let's just be honest. You named Kevin Ross and, and Lucky Day. They're both in their 30s. And, you know, Lucky Day's been at this for over a decade now and, and, and just hit. And, yeah, he, he is a, a decent example, but. You know, like, we're not going to see an 18-year-old, 20-year-old singer come out now. I don't feel I can ever be able to appeal to people my age or even my parents' age. Like, that is just, I just can't see any way. Because kids, I mean, the, their sound they're listening to now, from what I hear, is totally different. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, again, it's it's positioning. I'll get throw another name out. Daniel Caesar. He's actually in his early 20s. He's someone that could appeal if positioned that way. He he will not be positioned that way because he will be marketed toward younger audiences. If he was positioned to both, I think you could. I think back to when Alicia Keys dropped. That's an artist who came out that was super young, but everybody's mama loved Fallen because it was something that was a throwback to a different time and it bridged that gap. We don't see artists being positioned. And I'm not saying they don't want to, they may want to. But they aren't positioned to a place where they can bridge the gap. So to his question, I don't think it's going to happen. But there are a few artists there that have the ability and the building blocks and tools to make it happen. But it ain't going to happen. <laughs> hmm. And then the other name I, I'll throw out as, as far as not having a division, no pun intended to Davison. But oh. uh, Bruno Mars, I think, was the last example of someone that came into R&B and spread the love throughout Urban AC all the way to the younger generation. But, you know, he came across as a pop act to begin with, so I think he was at an advantage. No, the reason why I... You, he's a good point as far as his last album. The reason why I would shy away from him a little bit is because his whole album was kind of styled in a sort of throwback way. So by default, it was going to kind of appeal to them anyway. But as an emerging artist... I don't think just him as an artist would. I think his the music that he put out that one time would. I'll just add that uh, Daniel Caesar does not appeal to me in any way. Well, we <laughs> know on. you have issues, so <laughs> that's a personal problem, player. Oh, come on. All right. 
And here's another one. This will be maybe the last one we do today because we do have to get into the play of please. But mm-hmm. uh, someone asked, if you were to put a super group together, sort of like a TGT or an LSG, what would your group be? Let's do female and male. Hmm. What? Oh. That's, that's, that's a tough one to answer on the spot. Yeah, that's tough on the spot. Let me try to think real quick. Are we looking Kyle, for three and yours. three? Uh, we want three I mean, and I th- guess three on each side? Let's do three and guess three. That's as big as you want. Kyle, you got to go first. Oh, man. Well, if we're going to go female. See, I hate it because it was actually supposed to happen with Tamia, Deborah Cox, and I think it was Kelly Price, right? Queen. Yeah. To me, that probably would have been it. Just because they all are great vocally. But if I have to be like original and create my own thing. I mean, you got to put Tamia in there. I think her tone just works out no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Someone like Jasmine, just because I feel like her voice, it just works in so many different ways. And... Like- all I can think about is these artists clashing while trying to make this work out. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's tough to make groups work out. But seriously, you, if I, anyone's out there listening, I, you know, <laughs> send us your suggestions. See, we want to hear what you guys think. Yeah, but you're uh, thinking about the you're thinking about the politics. You're making it too yeah, difficult. Yeah, the ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, think, cause that's going to destroy anybody. You know who I, I what, forgot recent? Go ahead, Kyle. Before go, I jump in. Well, I was going to say I think Ed's. I'm going to predict your top three for your R&B super group okay. for females. Okay. You want Fantasia, Jennifer Hudson, and <laughs> Beyonce Circa. And Kelly Circa Price? 2000, Beyonce <laughs> Circa 2007. Ring the alarm, Beyonce. You want that. Um, I would not want that because my eardrums would not want to be in my head if that was what we got. Because <laughs> they would on. be busted all over the place. Jeez. <laughs> Anyway, the group that I thought of, and this the only reason I thought of this is because I just recently over on Soul and Stereo, go check it out. I ranked the 50 best R&B albums of the 2010s. We'll talk about that later. But an artist that doesn't get enough love that I feel like would work in a great group with Tamia and Jasmine would be Melanie Fiona. Throw those two together. Mm. Yep. Mm. Mm. And then Ed, we can uh, we can throw away Kelly and add Deborah Cox back in there to complete the Canadian trifecta. Uh, there was a person on Twitter that claimed that all we did was show Canadians love. Well, here we go. I'm showing Canada some love here, Tom. Why do we only <laughs> show Canada love? That's the weirdest thing to complain about. I I don't know. <laughs> um, Tom, I'm I'm gonna go with you... an all Philly connection. Can I do that? Uh, Yes, you can. All right. So for the female side, we got Jill Scott, Jasmine Sullivan, and Marsha Ambrosius. Mm-hmm. I like the sound of it. For the male side, we're going to go with Music Soul Child, Glenn Lewis, and Fatin Dantzler. You know who I want to produce that? Get Jazzy Jeff on the boards. That could be something. Both sides. Kyle, like if I, I'm sure you're confused. The male singer from Kindred, the Family Soul. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh thank my you. God. <laughs> well, here's I'm another one. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well, I was going to say for males, Joe, Brian McKnight, and who's another top-notch male singer with the smooth vocals? I'm trying not to say TGT here, but who else? No, don't pick one of them. Yeah. They, Tyrese might end the whole uh, thing. Tech might have them trapping. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh huh. Who's the third one? Wait, say the first two again. Joe Brian McKnight. Dude, and... imagine if you went with, with imagine going with Stokely to top that off. Right. <laughs> That'd be crazy. Ah, uh, you stole mine. I was gonna do that. Wow. I mean, this. I'm this, gonna switch. Yeah. I'm going to switch it up a little bit and kind of cheat. I would like to see Stokely, Case, and then Wale thrown in to kind of give it like the hip-hop <laughs> wow. feel. Wale. Wale I love the cut. Your boy. Your boy. I did it just for you, Tom. 
And if he's not available, they could go with Philly's most wanted. <laughs> you can go with Philly's most wanted and go away from this podcast is what you can do. <laughs> yep. Well, here's a name I'll throw out there just because in order to have a super group, they got to also be able to write. And mm-hmm. some intro fans will be really excited about this one. We need Kenny Green in the mix. Mm. Because that I mean, debut intro album, man, his vocals, smooth. Like Wait butter. a minute. No, Kenny is gone, player. Well, this is, a, this is, a, this is fiction. You can't bring people back from the uh, dead for your group. Listen, We're talking about groups that existed. Listen, he, he's gone. We're going to have to go with Eric Roberson instead as a writer. Okay, that All makes right. me feel better. I was going to hack into Kenny Green's laptop, take all those unreleased songs, and put Joe's vocals on it. I oh, mean, I wouldn't man. be mad, because I know he got some heat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's wrap this up here. Was that fun, guys? We should probably do this every week. There's a lot of questions this here. This was good. Yeah, that was yeah good. we've got a bunch more questions. Shout out to everybody who contributed, because I just got a ton and just dumped them off. So we'll be back next week to kind of get to a few more. Yep. But let's get into the soul back track of the day really quickly. Let's go with the soul back album of the day because Tom spent a lot of time listening to albums. And I want to get into this one here. Kylie Dean's unreleased album, Simple Girl. We may have talked about it before, yes. but Tom, what were your takeaways from this album? You, I don't think you really listened to this album until recently, right? This was supposed to come out in 2002, if I remember correctly. I didn't listen to it when it came out too closely. I mean, everyone remembers "Make Me a Song." I remember the, you know, the, the pushback she got from putting that song out. People were saying she was singing an Aaliyah line, which was kind of pathetic. She was saying, Petty. "I want a song like an Aaliyah song." I mean, Petty. but um, but Kyle, I mean, it just really brought me back to the classic Timbaland productions when I hear this album, you know. And there's some gems on here, and I know you're, you're a big Kylie Dean fan. You interviewed her as well, Kyle. What did you think about this album? Yeah, well, before I get into that, I guess this will also coincide with our Where Are They Now? Because I know a lot of people are probably asking, where's Kylie Hmm. Dean been? So um, just to give you guys a quick summary, she was supposed to drop this album. It got shelved due to label politics. She went independent, um, created a little bit of buzz, um, but nothing really came through from that. And then over the last couple of years, she's been on tour with Madonna as her backup singer. So that's where Kylie Dean has really been. I think the last time I saw her, she started a GoFundMe to, to create a new EP. I'm not sure if that ever came mm-hmm. out, but in terms of the album itself, this is one of my favorite albums. Um, Ed, you won't wow. be surprised because this was sort of like a precursor to Afro DJ by Brandy. The same songwriters, the same producers, almost the same sound, but this is one of those records that just worked for me. It's one of those timeless songs or Timeless Albums, Timbaland's production was top-notch, and Kylie, as a singer, powerful vocals, and I think the biggest challenge was trying to figure out whether they were going to push her to the urban route or the pop route. Not really sure how it would have came out if it actually did come out, but this is one of my favorites. Hmm. I don't know if we've had a chance to really talk either offline, offline or online about her, but I am a huge Kylie fan. I don't think I actually own the album, but I have listened to it a billion times. So I am a huge fan of it. I think that if the reviewer in me was just kind of like, oh, it was a little too long. It was, I think she had like a few songs that were a little too poppy and a few a little bit too. T- so it felt a little kind of schizophrenic from a reviewer standpoint. But man, I love this album and really thought that we kind of lost something here. Because to this day, to this day. I still rock Simple Girl. I still rock As Days Gone By. I still rock Kiss Me Like That. She had some joints. And we know, like, Make Me a Song and the pettiness that came behind that. But it's kind of ridiculous that we lost a really, really talented vocalist. She was a great performer. And she, I think to Kyle's Mm. point, when he talked about her doing some stuff later on, she dropped a, I think it was an EP of remixes. Kind of, it was around yep. 2009 or 10 or so, where she was singing on other folk song. I remember that she sang over, um, what's the Usher joint? The Little Freak song? Yep. 
I'm blanking on the name of yeah, Little Freak. That's a, with the Polo to Don beat. Like she yep. took that was hot. She did I think AO Technology that was hot. So I love that she was able to take those beats, do her own thing on it, still just showcase her powerful vocals. She even flipped the lyrics a little bit to make it a little bit more personal. She was a talent. So I'm a huge Kylie fan. Come back, player. We need you. <laughs> you know, yep. Kyle, something, something I mentioned to you um, on her single, uh, Make Me a Song. And, and I don't know if you caught this, but she asked Timberland, Timberland to make her a song like Rock the Boat, right? Like for Aaliyah. Now, Timberland didn't produce that song for Aaliyah. I don't know if anyone ever realized that or caught that. But Oh, I caught I, it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, probably most people didn't, but I found that interesting. Yeah, and I'm sure it was a little. I always took it as kind of creative license, and, and that she didn't yeah, literally yeah. mean it because people, of course, people just ran with that. I am so glad this didn't drop in the social media era because can you imagine the dragon <laughs> this poor girl would have gotten? She did not yep. want to be the new Aaliyah. She just was like, "Hey, y'all raid hits for Missy and Aaliyah. Make me a hit." That's basically yeah. what the song was about. Not turn me and take off Aaliyah's face and put it on mine, you weirdos. <laughs> I'm still uh, mad about it. She should have been huge. Yep. But it's time to get into the play of please. And uh, from one Timbaland protege to another, Carrie Hilson was on social media being crazy. Oh, uh, my gosh. Or not this being crazy. Mess. I'm sorry. That, that might be mean. But uh, she had a theory. I'll say on, it. Crazy. On, on this <laughs> coronavirus stuff. Uh, she blamed it on the 5G network. So, guys, I need you to turn off your phone or you might be impacted as well. Ed, is Carrie Hilson right? Well, obviously not, because if she was really afraid of the 5G, she would have turned off her phone and we wouldn't have to deal with her foolishness for coming out here making up stuff. See, this is why I'm heated, because I have spent the last week working myself to the bone, no toilet paper in the house, no meat in the house, just eating cardboard pizzas. Because Carrie Hilson and friends out here stirring up rumors and getting folks crazy on social media, social media. And then I think she said to her, um, did she say her label made her take all the tweets down? Or she had some yeah, apology her, that was really yeah, weird. Yeah, manager from told her field. to take it down. Yep. Well, I'm glad somebody has some sense in the house. Stop getting your news from Carrie Hilson, people. Good Lord. I mean, Kyle, Carrie Hilson's got some new music coming out this summer, though, right? She's returning. Mm, I don't know anymore. Oh wait, wait, wait! That was last, that was last summer. Year. Sorry, I got, yeah. I got my I got my years mixed up. Sorry. Yeah, that five G is messing with you, Tom. <laughs> uh, shout out to Carrie. We hope you come back soon. But Tom, here's a play, it please, for you. Um, as you know, a lot of establishments, a lot of restaurants, pretty much everything is closed at this point, except GameStop, which just put out Animal Crossing <laughs> yesterday. Did you get the game? No, I never had any of the Animal Crossing games. Did I get it? Apparently, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, Ed, and it survived the pandemic. Ed, aren't you a former GameSpot employee? Yeah, I am a former back in the day when it was known as Babbage's. Mm. I was in that thing for, what, four or five years I worked there? It was ridiculous. And speaking as a former Babbage's slash GameStop employee, I can tell you, they ain't shutting that place down for nothing. So you might as well just put on your hazmat suit and go get your, your your Animal Crossing, a game I've never played, by the way. Go on and get that. Go, and they're going to try to sell you the little warranty in case you break it or whatever. <laughs> Give them their little commission oh. so they don't get fired. Listen, I know the struggle. I remember having to sell these little things called Game Doctors, where you put, it was this green thing, and you oh. put your CD in and apparently cleaned it, and they were like, had us at gunpoint that we had to sell these stupid things. So I know the struggle. I don't. I never get mad at employees, but GameStop, oh. yep, they're gonna make you work through every bit of that pandemic. Hope you got Wait. a lot of ginger ale to help you ward off that illness, because they ain't getting off. <laughs> Wait, did that game doctor thing actually work? I mean, it worked. It it was weird. You put the disc in, and it was like this crank, like you were making butter. And you had to kind of <laughs> spin it around. If you want to what? give yourself carpal tunnel, yeah, I guess it would work. But please, how much? Is, it was like $10. You think that thing is actually going to do something? 
to back in the day when we had Nintendo, the classic Nintendo, we just used to blow in the cartridge to get the dust out, and that yes. would make it work. Yep. <laughs> what we would do on the PS games, I would just literally just wipe the disc on my pant leg, and that got the <laughs> dust off. But no, we had to sell these weird machines to people, and ugh. I do not miss those days. I miss GameStop, but I don't miss selling the junk. Well, let me give you some fun facts before we get out of here. So, Tom, apparently blowing the cartridge is actually like really bad for the game. Uh, uh, but it's too late now. There are, no, there are no video game cartridges anymore. Um, and then, right. Ed, and as far as the CDs, I used to actually, and no one actually knows that you can do this, but you can just run it through water, and it'll clean it right off. Really? I've heard I've heard yeah. that. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that. I know you're not supposed to use cleaner on it cuz people would oh, come no. in with Windex and spray it and I'm and you could look at the back of the disc and it looks like somebody just wiped it through mud. Like, player, you use clean Windex on this. Don't do that. But yeah, yeah. I heard water works. I never tried it. Y'all ain't messing up my Final Fantasy 7. I'll take this. <laughs> All right, let's end off this podcast here. Let's end it up on a positive note. I want everyone to name a R&B ballad from the 90s, just so everyone can go listen to it. Tom? The first song that came to mind for some reason is Boys to Men, End of the Road. I don't know why, yeah. but hopefully that, this freaking that is, uh, virus is... That, might, that might not be the best time to listen <laughs> to that song, Tom. It might be the end. No, this, <laughs> no, this virus is coming to the end of the road, not... The world, guys. Oh, chill. All right. <laughs> oh, uh, no. We just needed some clarification here. Cause I'm like, no. <laughs> Ed? Ed? Uh, what's a good ballad? Um, I mean, there's so many. It's weird. It's like picking a, picking one Skittle out of the bag. It's just like, where do you go? Um, SWV Week? Like, eh? wow. There's just so many. Wow. So the, you're right. saying the virus got you weak? Okay. Oh, it definitely got me weak. <laughs> well, I'm going to have one that's not as depressing. Uh, Softest Place on Earth by Escape. Tom, I'll give you a million bucks if you know who wrote this song. Diane First Warren. First of all, you ain't got a million bucks. <laughs> Listen, I'll set up for, I'll set up for ten uh, face masks. Uh, Diane Warren. <laughs> no. Joe Thomas. Diane okay. Warren. No. Joe Thomas. Wow. Oh, that's I don't think I knew that. But that song was way yeah. too sexy for Diane. She did not write that song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, boy. All right, guys. I think that's it for this week's podcast. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening in. And hopefully we'll be back next week. Ed, go to the <laughs> store now. Get your meat. <laughs> <laughs> that just didn't sound right. But okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> All right, guys. We're out. All right. Peace. I, 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 I.